Hello, everyone. Welcome to our show at this year's CR Arthritis event at the Canadian Rheumatology Association and Arthritis Health Profession Association annual meeting in Winnipeg. I'm Kelly Lenvoy, VP of Communications and Public Affairs. Today, we're lucky that we're being joined by Dr. Stephanie Garner. And she is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Medicine and Rheumatology at the University of Calgary. She holds a master's degree in medical science from the University of Calgary in the area of models of care for patients with rheumatic disease. Dr. Garner, your presentation in Winnipeg is on updates in ANCA associated vasculitis management through cases and collaboration. And to start off on what sounds like a fairly uh, challenging or complicated subject area, um, maybe we can put uh, at the first uh, effort here, put a spotlight on vasculitis and you can tell us what that disease is. Yeah, so vasculitis is an autoimmune disease um, similar to rheumatoid arthritis or lupus in which your body has developed antibodies um, or a reaction against itself. And in rheumatoid arthritis, you get antibodies or inflammation directed towards the lining of your joints, which causes joint swelling. Um, and in vasculitis, you're getting inflammation directed against your blood vessels. And there are several different types of vasculitis. Um, we usually look at what size of the blood vessels are involved or what the clinical features are, which um, whether it's affecting your heart or your lungs or your kidneys. And then we look at what antibodies are involved. So for example, in rheumatoid arthritis, we talk about the rheumatoid factor. In ANC associated vasculitis, it's a group of diseases for which we commonly see in ANCA which is an anti-nuclear cytoplasmic antibody, which is a bit of a mouthful, but ANCA is what we use for short form, direct, um, being positive in these patients. And we think it's that antibody which contributes to the autoimmune disease. And the inflammation of blood vessels, if you think blood vessels are all over your body, means that it can present in various ways. Usually mm. ANCA-associated vasculitis affects the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, can affect your nerves and it can affect your GI tract or your skin. So it does prevent present with lots of different clinical features. Um, and the kidneys are often affected, which is why um, one of the uh, people joining our workshop co-presenting with me is Dr. Bryce Barr, who's a kidney specialist in Winnipeg. Mm, uh, a complex disease. And in Winnipeg, you're gonna be talking about how patients can manage the disease. Um, in terms of therapies, what um, what are we looking at in terms of different types of therapies? So the mainstay of therapy for vasculitis for years has been prednisone. Hmm. And anyone who's been on prednisone will tell you it's a horrible drug. It works incredibly well, but the list of side effects is about as long as my arm um, weight gain, high blood pressure, diabetes, thin skin, easy bruising, it causes anxiety, difficulty sleeping. It works really well though, but it's kind of like taking a shotgun. So it fixes the problem um, quite quickly, but it causes a lot of harm. So one of the big shifts we've done over the past couple of years is looking at how we can use the least amount of prednisone safely to treat this disease. So a lot of that is involved, you know, when we're using medications in, in combination with prednisone, we call them induction agents, and then we call them maintenance agents, kind of like in cancer care, where you're gonna get treated aggressively with chemotherapy to get that cancer com completely gone. And then we put you on something to make sure it doesn't come back. So it's the same thing with vasculitis. We hit the uh, disease quite hard up front, we get all the inflammation to go away, and then we put you on a drug long-term. So the prednisone is often used initially to put everything out, and then we use other drugs, something called cyclophosphamide, which is a chemo drug. We use it in much lower doses though. And rituximab, which is a biologic, also used um, initially in therapy. And now we're trying to think, okay, 
is there a way we can use these drugs so we can use less and less and less prednisone? And what's the least amount we can get away with? And that's been a big shift in vasculitis care for patients over the past five to 10 years or so. That's interesting because I think um, patients sometimes hear that there are different guidelines in different countries. So I guess what I'm interested in is that this less is more paradigm shift that you're describing. Are we, is Canada leading the way? Are we following maybe other countries in Europe or in the United States in terms of the recommended dose? So we're lucky here in Canada um, in one sense. So uh, Dr. Mike Walsh, who published the PEXIVAS trial, which was one of the reasons why um, we now confidently, instead of giving people, you know, huge doses of steroids for months, we now know that we can safely cut that in half. He was the primary investigator on that trial, and he's based here in Canada. He's at McMaster. So he's really influenced our practice and sort of led this from a Canadian perspective, and it has had influence across the world. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, though, in sort of we're leading there for sure and sort of being confident dropping our steroids. Um, there's a new medication, which Dr. Barr and I am going to talk about a bit, that's used as adjuvant therapy. It means it's used as an add-on. Um, one of the main reasons they developed this medication was that they wanted to be able to get patients off prednisone right away. So instead of even have, so rather than even just doing this lower dose of prednisone, you would completely stop prednisone up front using something to replace it. So that drug that was brought to market is called a Vacapan. Um, and in Canada, unfortunately, um, it's not going to be covered by provincial plan. So um, for those of you who sort of are in health policy, you might know that when a drug gets approved by Health Canada, which health Avacopan has been approved by Health Canada, it then goes to a common drug review board, which has representation from across the provinces. And they look at the medication and they say, do we think this would benefit patients and sort of at what cost? And unfortunately, um, much to the upset of the patient foundation in Canada and physicians caring for vasculitis patients, um, CADETH said that they wouldn't recommend it be funded. We've been lucky enough now still in Canada that we're able to access it through the company. They have an excellent compassionate care program and there are some private insurers paying for it. Um, but it is a little bit frustrating because our system is often compared to the NHS, which is the British system. And uh, Avacapan is covered in by the sort of National Pharmacare in England or in in uh, over in the UK, um, the United States. Most payers are paying for it also. So we're a little bit hamstrung here. We've been lucky because we've got a um, the corporation here in Canada has been very supportive of use. Um, but you know it is definitely some work there to be done in terms of seeing what options are to get it covered. Um, because that drug does allow us to stop steroids completely um, in a significant portion of patients with vasculitis. Uh, there was an issue of Joint Health Insight that ACE published on the drug review and approval process. So that's something that um, our audience has seen us talk about in the, in the last year. And certainly in terms of advocating for uh, appropriate timely coverage of arthritis medications. That's one of our missions at ACE. And uh, this is something that we're talking to the provinces about uh, currently. So I thank you for bringing, bringing that important I, point up. I will say too, while I'm sort of advocating provincial access. So we use two medications in vas ankyvasculitis to sort of put out the fire, get them under control initially. Um, the first is cyclophosphamide, which is a really old drug. It's a, it is a chemo drug. Um, it's still used in chemo protocols for malignancy. Um, it's onerous for patients. It's an IV infusion. There's 10 infusions over six months. You need blood mm. work with the infusion. Um, and then the newer drug, which newer, I mean, you know, came out in 2010. So we're now at, you know, 14 years of experience with this medication is rituximab. Um, mm -hmm. It works well, there's evidence to show it actually probably works better in certain patient populations than cyclophosphamide. 
But again, we're hamstrung by coverage. Um, and, you know, generic rituximab is cheaper than the brand name. Rituxim uh, cyclophosphamide's old, but again, I think it's that, you know, the the payers aren't really looking at the whole picture. And, you know, I have patients who have to drive three hours from a rural community to come in for their infusion. Then they have to drive back somewhere again to get their blood work the next week. And to do that 10 times over six months is quite labor intensive. You also need nursing staff to do the infusion, um, hospital chairs, access here for us right now in Calgary, getting someone a booking in day medicine for this. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, phoning around, do you want one of my kids? Really mm. trying to get that versus mm. rituximab is two infusions and that's it. You know, we would do maintenance therapy in six months. So the care for vasculitis has really been a bit tricky, uh, mainly because we're sorting out coverage. And I'm a rheumatologist. I'm used to drug coverage being a huge proportion of my job, but it's a little it's it's getting a little bit more complicated for this patient population and it delays their access you know alberta blue cross takes a couple of weeks before they'll approve or uh, decline something which delays treatment versus if you look at practice in the united states or uh, as i said the uk rituximab is given sort of maybe 70 percent of the time with cyclophosphamide 30 percent of the time and our numbers are definitely not that high yet, predominantly because of access. Now, in terms of therapies, there's also a type of uh, therapy for vasculitis, maintenance therapies. Um, how do you determine the most appropriate uh, maintenance therapy for a patient? Yeah, and it, it's a bit tricky because we have a lot of, when we do our clinical trials, you know, we usually look at two years, you know, we treat them for two years and then that's it. Um, and then there's some trials where they're treating them for two years and now they're following them for four years because we know the risk of relapse in this patient population where the disease comes back is actually quite high and it can be up to 70% over a five-year period. Wow. Um, and our traditional treatment paradigms have been that you treat for two years and then you see what happens. Um, but there's a lot of evidence that at least maybe half of patients are going to relapse in that next two years. Um, so we're really trying to figure out who are the patients we should be putting on, sort of longer term maintenance, and then what's the best drug. And this does again come down to coverage. It looks like rituximab is probably, and that's the infusion, it's once every six months. Mm -hmm. That probably is the best in terms of preventing relapse. Um, Again, it's a negotiation of coverage, depending where you are in Canada, you may or may not have access. If you have private insurance, generally that's a bit better than the public insurance. Um, azathioprine is our other option, but it doesn't work quite as well as rituximab. So when we're trying to make a case, being sort of a steward of the healthcare system, often it's these patients who have risk factors. We kind of have a somewhat idea of what puts you at increased risk of having a flare. So if you've got granulomatosis with polyangitis, which is one type of ankyvasculitis that affects the upper respiratory tract, we know you're at increased risk of flare. Um, so we try and use what we can to predict who we really should advocate for getting rituximab versus azathioprine, which are sort of the two mainstays of treatment. But it again, um, it, it really heavily depends where you are in Canada and what your insurance coverage is like, whether it be the public plan or you've got private insurance, what I can get covered. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that's often a gap with models of care for all the inflammatory um, arthritis diseases. And it's certainly not acceptable that uh, currently uh, there's no standard of care that where you live, and often that means the farther you are away from the southern urban uh, centers, uh, the more challenging it is to live with uh, with your disease. And certainly it's something, again, that's a real focus for, for ACE. Um, final question for us today, uh, uh, Dr. Garner, is around 
I mean, you've described, again, we'll say describe as a very complex disease. Um, there are multiple members uh, on a patient's healthcare team when you're dealing with a complex disease like vasculitis. How is it important that the different members of the, that team, the different specialties, um, uh, follow a, an interdisciplinary kind of team-based approach to the care of the patient? You know, I was really lucky in my training. I trained at McMaster. And one of the mm. key things that sort of had drawn me to doing some of my training there was the fact that they ran these collaborative clinics. And I think it's a real sort of it's that idea of you don't know what you don't know often. And in doing these clinics as part of my training and then as faculty, it was either my, you know, a rheumatologist and a kidney specialist, a rheumatologist, a kidney specialist, and a lung specialist, or a rheumatologist and a lung specialist. And one of the nice things about that was that we often need to make decisions in the moment. And I'm an expert in immunosuppression. I'm an expert in arthritis. Um, but I don't know the nuances of the lungs or the nuances of the kidneys. So one of the things Dr. Barr is going to talk about at our talk is like, when do you worry about blood and protein in the urine in this disease? And what are the nuances of that? And one of the things I learned doing those clinics is I learned a lot about how to collaborate and how to talk to other specialists. I learned the importance of having that relationship with the other specialists so that if there was a concern, I could talk to them. You know, we're not sending these consult notes back and forth that take, you know, a week or a month to go back, you know, or we're not dumping it on the patient in the sense, you know, when you're at the appointment with your respirologist, your lung specialist, can you ask them what they think of this? Um, and it also kind of sends a clear message to the patient. So the collaboration on this is really important. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I'm doing one of the, I do a clinic with a kidney specialist here at the University of Calgary. Um, and I think it provides better patient care because I know what my colleague needs in terms of testing. So if I'm doing blood work, I know they want a urinalysis and a an, uh, protein to creatinine ratio. Um, I know the lung specialist, if I'm if the patients in the building seeing me, they might want a chest x-ray and I'm going to do that. So I think it, this really close collaboration with our colleagues really is important. Um, it improves communication and I think it directly benefits patient care. But you really have to get a good sense of what the other specialist wants to provide this holistic care and a disease that can affect, you know, many different organ systems in a you know, when medicine, we're kind of used to staying in our box, you know, the cardiologists like the heart, kidney specialists like the kidneys. Um, so working with people who, you know, can kind of look at patients holistically and have those strong communication skills is really important for patients. That's uh, really an important point and perspective for, for our audience, especially those living with vasculitis. Um, I think the one of the key takeaways from today is given the nature, the complex nature of the disease, um, how important it is that patients keep informed, um, keep open regular lines of uh, communication with their healthcare team and being able to have a, a constructive, positive conversation with them as their disease uh, evolves, but so does the, the 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 treatment and therapies for it. So that treatment plan is not something static, but something that probably is ever changing. Um, really important for people, uh, patients to uh, to keep informed. And um, we thank you, uh, Dr. Garner, for joining us today, uh, talking about a really important subject area. And uh, we wish you uh, a good uh, a good meeting in Winnipeg, and good luck with your presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today on the show. Um, look forward to seeing you again uh, as we bring you more updates and more interviews with leaders like Dr. Garner from the annual meeting. Thank you for joining us. 